And that's that. I'm going to actually stop this here. Okay. Did it just go off? No, it's still there. And I'm going to start a... How do I start a new track? Pro, uh, project... There we go. Right. Welcome to the Dune Saga Podcast. I'm David Moulton. I am Scott Hertzog. And I'm Jim Arrowwood. And on this episode, we're going to be talking about Dune House of Trades, the first book in the Prelude to Dune series by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. That is awesome. I, you know, this book was awesome. I enjoyed it. It was a different feel from the other three books. Very different. Yeah, very, very, very different. I think we should go around and talk about when we actually finished this book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last month, Scott finished 15 minutes before we recorded. Yes, just to clarify that. But I did not stay up all night. <laughs> so, <laughs> I read for 12 hours from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> to finish this book in time. <laughs> it's, it's, it, is, it is true. It is true. And I'm the 4.0 student here who did my homework weeks ago. So yeah. <laughs> I think I finished it a week and a half ago and um, have since moved on to House Harkonnen, Harkonnen and um, and uh, I'm halfway through that. Jim, I understand you're a little bit further than that. Yeah, I'm about ready to finish that one up. Yeah, now uh, it might be advisable for you to like maybe wait. To, to 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 like start the third one <laughs> to we're closer to the date. <laughs> I've got I've got one uh, one book that I want to read in between. So uh, there you okay, go. there you go. <laughs> yeah. I promise. I'm, yeah, I, I'm the same way. I have the uh, St Steve Jobs autobiography that I want, uh -huh. not the biography, I guess, that I want to read. I've never read it. I've kind of been wanting to. I got it from the library and burned it. So. Yeah, it, it, it's my goal to read two books a month, but this month I barely got one done. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on. Uh, it's good you have a podcast to keep you keep you accountable. That's right. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> oh man. That's so, awesome. In this book, we're introduced to what I would say is our main story. Our main family, right? Yeah. Like yeah. the the main uh this is the beginning of what we're going to be, the people we're going to be with, uh, the family lines, all the way through. I mean, I guess, you know, uh, Legends of Dune, we could say, yeah, it's them, but it, it's that was 10,000 years yep. before uh, these things happened, so it's a total different, it's almost a completely different universe. Yeah, well, it, it feels a way, you, you, there's remnants of it. We're going to talk about how this connects a little bit later yeah. on, but there's remnants of the old universe that you kind of see through, like, oh yeah, that happened then. What's interesting is that this was the first book that came out that they published, right? After this is the first book that Kevin Janderson yeah. and mm -hmm. Brian Herbert published, you know, after Frank Herbert died. Right. Uh, so this was the one where people were kind of laying down their expectations. We're going to talk about that in a listener uh, feedback show, but mm -hmm. people are laying down their expectations uh, about what this series is going to be like and how does this stack up to the originals. This is where everyone was kind of throwing throwing down, right? Right. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that we've been hearing about. The other two, uh, when we were doing our bad reviews, all that stuff kind of started with these books. Right. And so it, it's kind of been like a beaten dead horse. Right. By that point. But uh, but they're very different. They're, you know, they're, yeah. they're not as actiony. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Not as actiony. Yeah, very uh, very much more of a political lounge, landscape. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. So basically, what we see in this story, it's the it's this one's House of Trades, so it's very focused on House of Trades. So we're introduced to our main character of Duke Leto. Um, well, he becomes Duke Leto. It's Leto Trades. Um, we get introduced to the hierarchy of the Harkonnens and uh, Baron Harkonnen in his prime when he's all fit and, and trim. And uh, we kind of get to see what was going on with House Carino and how they were running the Empire and how. Uh, Elrud, to, or not Elrud, um, uh, what's, what's the... The son? The son. Uh, Shaddam. Shaddam. No, thank how, you. How Shaddam rose to power. Yeah. Uh, and uh, him and Count Fenring, how they kind of... 
forgot where they were. And that's basically the plot line that's in this book. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Um, I know. I, I do have a question, and maybe I'm jumping the gun. Why do they call him the Padishah Emperor? Like, what does Padishah mean? I didn't even look this up. I should have. I don't know. Do you know, Jim? I, you know, I I did look that up, but it was weeks ago, so I can't okay. remember exactly. Well, it's it a is. good thing I'm sitting in front of my computer, and there's something called the Google. Like, it. it actually, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. You guys just just keep talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah it it is, uh, from my understanding, a term that is currently used. I think. I think you're I think you're right. It's a familiar term to me. I just didn't. Um. Uh, yeah. well, one of the things I thought is really interesting about the hierarchy in this universe is it seems so wishy-washy. It's not like it's just like medieval hierarchy or um, like uh, you know any one kind of what's the word like uh, power structure that we're used to. They're just like all through. There's there's dukes, there's barons, there's you know counts, uh, emperor. Uh, you know, all these different levels. Uh, personally, I mean, I have no idea where they fit together because they're not normally uh, labels that would go that would go together. Not right. all of them. Like, some right. of them do and some of them don't. Yeah. So. Well, I did find it. The definition, it's actually a superlative royal title composed of a Persian pad, which means master, and the widespread shah king. So master king, basically, is what it means. Um, and... Um, it was like the great or the great king is kind of what it means. Oh, okay. So Padishah Emperor just means the great king emperor, great ruler emperor, or something like that. Of so, a million worlds. Yes, I guess you have to be the great king emperor then. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. I uh, I had to chuckle about midway through it. I mean, unless something's changed, I'm pretty sure adamantium still isn't a real thing. Uh Am I correct in that? <laughs> I don't even know. You know, that's what Wolverine's uh, skeleton is laced with—the unbreakable metal. Well, in the book, in the book, they reference adamantium, and I was like, okay, so go far enough in their history, and there were X-Men, and <laughs> <laughs> probably all related to the, the spice. Day. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same universe as X-Men. So I, I had a good chuckle about that. Uh, I also had—I also laughed. <laughs> Because it felt like I was reading Homer Simpson at one point when it was the Emperor's inner monologue, and he was just like, nobody would believe a stable boy. Stable boy. Mm. <laughs> and I was just like, it, it sounds like Homer with a donut. So <laughs> I, <was> just, <laughs> I don't know, I laughed at that. I thought it was fun. <clears throat> what kind of, what kind of uh, moments stuck out to you, Jim? Uh, the moments in the book that stuck out to me really big were almost comical whenever the Baron, Raban, and Piter got in the same room together. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it was it was kind of like a dark Three Stooges kind of thing that went on. Raban and, and Piter fighting for attention and, and for more favor, and, and the Baron is like, why don't you guys just go away? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought I thought that was a lot of comical areas in there. Yes, sure, for sure. Anything funny stick out to you, Scott? The fu funny? Yeah, but you know, or any anything. moments? Well, well, if you want to move on to the moments, well, we can. funny. Um, no, it was a very serious novel for me. And so, like when I look at it, I don't think I don't think of this being. There are some great moments in yes. this novel. Um, for me, what for me reading this novel, the thing that I really liked um, uh, was um, the fact that I'd want. I think I told you uh, when we were at Farpoint mm -hmm. that uh, that that the thing that I liked is I I actually took the time to go back and when I was on the treadmill one day I said I'm going to watch the David Lynch movie. Right, I'd never seen the David Lynch movie ever, and and I'm glad, and I and so I had, I had done this prior to hitting House of Trades, and I'm actually glad I did because it was so long ago since I last read Dune that for me having that kind of as a primer, mm -hmm. whether it was bad or good, made me realize as I hit the names in the book 
that these were the important figures to be tracking. Yeah. And even though they may not be represented accurately or fully in the movie, you know, as we hit, and especially when you hit, you know, House of Car Har House of Conan, the second book, um, you, you just hit all these characters like, okay, these are playing into the greater storyline, and these are building into the greater storyline. And so for me, that's what I like going into these. Um, um, because it's quite a shift to come from the Butler and Jihad series into this series. It's very, very different. I mean, you're, you're away from the action. Um, it's a whole different group of characters that are only briefly kind of touched on, mm -hmm. um, and there's some brief connections to it. Everything moves much slower. And yes. There's, there's there's more of a political flavor to this, and a lot of a lot of political infighting, and and not mm -hmm. so much not not so much of the uh, battle action going on, but. Uh, it's like a chess game. Everybody's maneuvering to get where they want to be. Yeah. No. Yeah, I t totally, totally agree. Totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned time, and and I agree with you. But when you go back to the Machine Crusade, the Machine Crusade did not happen like that. That novel was maybe a year in length. So as far as time wise. It moves slow. It wasn't until the subsequent books after that that we move a bit quicker. You know, jump of 60 years, you know, 60 years, 100 years later, right. those sorts of things. But you don't see that in the first book. Well, you don't see that certainly in this book either. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. I, I have to say, when you told me that you went and watched the movie and got, like, refreshed, part of me was like, oh, <laughs> Not because you watched the movie, but I was like, you know, going through this journey... Uh, I, I kind of wanted to see your reaction as to learning these characters without knowing who was going to be important. You know what I mean? Uh, to, to see what... I, no, I hear you. I hear you. You know what? Um, I, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and there's a part of you that's probably, you're probably right. Um, but for me, it, it helped me. It helped focus me a little right. bit. Right. I understand. Like, yeah. I, get the way that makes, I get why it makes it more enjoyable. And for me, um, for me, it's not like I hadn't... Like, I watched... Dune when it came out in the miniseries. I right. watched the children of Dune. It's not like the stories were unfamiliar to me in those areas. Right. Um, like, we still don't have Paul on the scene, you right. know, but we have the father. And we're following, you know, and, 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 and uh, Jessica. And she was just born. Right. So, so, I mean, you do have some of that. And the Emperor yeah. and um, the Baron. The ages are always something that seems weird to me. I mean, it's, I guess I just don't grasp how long everyone lives, but right. some people seem like they should be way older <laughs> yeah. or or they're too young or you know, it doesn't quite doesn't quite fit right. But well, uh, see that's one thing that blew me away when I read this. I wasn't really aware of how much time had fallen in between. And when I saw the name Abulard, it was like, Whoa, this guy has been alive a long time, hasn't he? <laughs> so, yeah. 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 No, it's just a descent. Great descent. Yeah. Ten thousand years. Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. And and Avalard doesn't play a lot into this book. Yeah, I don't think that he's mentioned in the original series at all. Well, he's he's mentioned in he's mentioned in this book. Well, in this book, but, but I mean, he's he's only mentioned. You really don't encounter him. Right. It's not until the next book, which. Is more based on their house. Right. Yeah. Yeah, where you get that a little bit more. But we can't talk about that, yeah. Jim. Sorry. Well, before we get too far. I just want to remind everyone that if you haven't read this book in a long time and you're listening along, or if you're like some of our listeners who have expressed that they don't like the writing of Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, but they still want to listen, we do have a show called Dune in 10 that airs at the exact same time that this does, where you can go and listen to a quick, roughly 10-minute summary of the book. Yeah. Uh, it'll have all the very, very basic information you need to know to grasp the story. Um, so there's yeah. that, and also if you want to uh, be a part of the conversation, we have our listener feedback show that goes Absolutely. up this month now. Yep, and one eight 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 five zero eight four three four three, and you can call in and join the conversation. Yeah, and that, yeah, and uh, and, and David promises it'll be thorough and a concise summary. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what, it is worth listening to just to hear David cram nine hundred pages into ten minutes. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's actually it really they really should have a Guinness Book of World's record record for it because I don't know how 
you can do that, but he manages to do it. I'm not going to lie. It takes, like, almost three hours to write. <laughs> just, <laughs> just because, like, I have to sit there and think of all the details, and, I, and I'm thinking, I'm like, is this important? Should I, do I put it? And then I go back and read it. You didn't need to know that information. It doesn't matter. It's like, it doesn't get you anywhere. And then it's like, how can I make this faster? Oh, man. I am, I am consistently surprised that I pull it off. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, not to mention he tweaks the speed a little bit so he can speak a little bit faster. I'm just kidding. He I don't tweak the speed. I, <laughs> I, just, I, just I just make out some breaths, though. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, look. Wow, he did that without breathing. That's awesome, man. <laughs> One run-on sentence <laughs> for 10 minutes. All right. Well, let's move into uh, talk a little bit more about the plot of this. Um, we kind of skirted around this as far as how this touches, how this connects into the Butler and Jihad. And we do see some connections back through in this, um, as we looked at this novel. Uh, David, could you start us off maybe just talking a little bit about how does this connect to the series that we just got done talking about? And... Uh, obviously, we're we're not dealing with the with the schools of Dune. We're talking about not including them. But how does this tie right. back in? Right. I have to. I want to first say when I read these before. Obviously, these came out before the Legends of Dune series. I I I didn't grasp the genius that that takes place. The, these books. It's almost House of Trades. It's almost hard to believe that it was written before. The Legends of Dunes books, because so much stuff is referenced mm. that it's just like, how did they remember that to talk about this or talk <laughs> about that? Like I just kind of like, oh, they mentioned this little thing, and then it, it was such a big thing in the Legends of Dune series. Like it just like, right? I, I thought that was I thought that was great. So most of the stuff that we're seeing is 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 going to be references to the jihad, uh, don't make machines with human, right. with human minds. Um, um, the DNA uh, data banks that the Bene Gesserits have that was started in... Um, right. uh, when it, what was the last book called that we read? Uh, Battle of Korea. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. If anything, it, it, reading this, having had just read the Legends of Doom series, I am hungry for the school books. I really wish that they were done and that we could have read them because I just there's so much information that I'm like, oh, I just want to know how they got from point A to point B. Yeah. Now. Well, let me go ahead and uh, call my best friend Kevin J. Anderson and have him like work on those a little bit faster for you, David. <laughs> Thanks. <'Cause laughs> I, I would I would be grateful if you could get right, right. with that. Um, in the book, we, we see a lot of references to the old stuff in the in the quotes that comes up. But another cool thing is that you see that, that history has been twisted. I mean, it's ten thousand years. Oh yeah. So some of these quotes are like, "Yeah, it's not quite how it was," but I could see, repeat, 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 and down the line, this is kind of whispered down the lane how memory yeah. of that that situation would be. Yeah. How about you, uh, Jim? How do, uh, do you how do you see connections between this book and the prior three that we read? Um, well, pretty much just the Orange Catholic Bible. Uh, oh yeah. The, the fear of, uh, of machines taking over again, um, how some of the, some of the people, like the folks on X, the Vernius family is just skirting the edge of the, of the machine law, things like that. Um, the, how the, how the, uh, Carinos have, become dictators as opposed to rulers. I didn't expect that at the end of uh, uh, the other series. Yeah. 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 Did you see we got a YouTube comment from BLH? <laughs> oh, I don't, it didn't pop up. Didn't pop up? No, it didn't. So go ahead and look at it. Uh, he just mentioned, and he was commenting on the, I think the, the Padasha Oh, stuff. no, I'm sorry. He, he's, he, oh, is he? Yeah, he just said that it was, he, he believed it was Persian. Yeah, well, he he was right. It yeah, is Persian, so yeah. I didn't miss. You know, it, it didn't pop up to my screen here. It Should didn't. no. Okay, we're experimenting. For those of you uh, yeah. who don't know, we're we we broadcast live now, and we're trying to get it so you can chat with us while we're. Recording. Uh, yep. So um, we're still uh, figuring out how to do this. So <laughs> so um, so as long as you keep checking that. Yeah, I got the email. Okay, up, good. So I saw the good. So we, we will track. We'll keep track of it. So if you want to comment, great. Um, you know, the other thing that we didn't mention is that the, the animosity between the houses, mm -hmm. that, that, that's been established from the Battle of Corinth. 
right? Yeah. So especially between the Harkonnen houses and the Atreides houses, yeah. uh, and just you know how that played out with the with the Duke and the death of the Duke and on down through. Um, and you really learn how the politics of this society works with the Duke's wife being manipulated by Harkonnen from old connections that she had and yeah. allowing him to be in a position where her husband could die. It's been a very, it's because, you know, it, this book really, again, as we said, really focuses much more on the politics than any of the original, or the, when I say the first three that we read. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. 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 Well, very cool. Well, let's. Uh, why don't we get into some maybe uh, moments? Uh, maybe it's easiest to talk about favorite moments or storylines that kind of jumped out to us as we uh, talk about this. And uh, Jim, why don't you go ahead and start us out here? Uh, the one that really stands out to me the most would probably be Duncan Idaho. Uh, uh, I because, love Duncan Idaho. Yeah. Because since, of course, I have, you know, I read the series, the original series of books years ago, he just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And to read his origin story was a real treat. Mm -hmm. And to find out that he was on Geedy Prime and interacting with uh, Raban and those guys and, and getting away from them, I just thought that was really cool. That was a great storyline. Yeah. I, I I liked seeing how the rift between uh, Shaddam and Leto began. Because even when reading the original books, I know I'm jumping ahead here for people who don't know, the whole reason everything goes to Dune is because uh, politics, Shaddam sends Leto there mm -hmm. as a trap. Mm -hmm. So... The big thing, the big thing for me was like, even when reading that, I did, I couldn't understand like why didn't he like, why doesn't he really like the, um, why doesn't the emperor like Leto? What's the, what's the big deal? And here it's kind of like, he laid out his plans for revenge for so long that it was kind of, it was kind of crazy. All right, hey, my son really wants to say hi to you, Jim. Oh. Hi, hi, Jim. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Good. All right. Did you have a good day today? Yep. Must probably get close to your bedtime, huh? Yep, 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 yep. All right. <laughs> See you, buddy. Okay. I love good you. Good night, Keith. Good night. 8.30. See ya. But, but when are we going to have it on his tree? Oh, it's downstairs. You can have it whenever. Can we have it now? I don't know. Did you have a snack? Yeah, no, but I didn't get a story either. Well, well maybe, I don't know, you'll have to talk to Mommy about that. Can I have a story and a snack? Because we we're not right. going to get a chance to eat the delicious ice cream. Uh, ice cream. <laughs> All right, we, we got to keep, we got to record. Want him to... No, it's not, that's your decision. He's Are you really that. hungry? All right, and we're back. I don't know where we're at. Oh, you know what? We've been, you were talking. Yeah, I was talking about how um, Leto and uh, Shaddam, how they're, the wedge that was put in there in this book is the thing that he holds on to and gets back at him for. Right. Well, you know, and we got to, I want to jump back, Duncan Idaho, because we. I, I do want to comment. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. But um, uh, one of the things, Jim, that I really loved about Duncan Idaho, you, you meet him running in these little shafts of some building that the Harkonnens have created to have basically support. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're hunting him, and he manages to escape you know, through these repulsor tubes and gets out the other side and then sees his parents brutally slaughtered there, right? Oh, yeah, uh, that's horrible. What a, what a heartbreaking scene. And, and then when they repeat this scene when um, – uh, what's the Baron's uh, nephew's name? Raban. Yeah, thank you. Raban. When Raban hunts him on the, in, that, in that forest and he escapes and manages to outwit him, oh, I'm just like loving it, loving yes. it. Yes, yes. And he's just he, – I agree. He, he is – anytime 
when I'm listening to the book, anytime I get back to him, I'm like, ah, oh, it's Duncan again. It's Duncan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Duncan's story. Duncan's story is great. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I agree, Jim. He's it's one of my favorite parts. But you, oh. but you were talking about that rift between Leto and Shaddam, and definitely there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. follows, and you really don't see it again in in the first book. It's not. I mean, they're establishing actually seemingly a friendship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I, I just thought it was interesting because they never really touch on what. It's just you're supposed to assume something happened. And just the, the fact that we have that information now is, is kind of cool. Yeah. For me, I, oh, the, another thing I enjoyed seeing was you kind of, for most of the book, you kind of think of Raban as very similar to his uncle, to the Baron. Mm. You're like, oh, they're kind of like, they're kind of interchangeable. But then as the book goes on, you kind of realize that Raban's not as intelligent as, I know. as the Baron is. Like He's more brutal. He's got that brutal streak. But when you really put him in a power position, he doesn't know how to handle himself. No, he doesn't. And it, well, and it really comes into play in the next book, which we aren't going to talk about right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, certainly. Um, I, you know, hey, I, Scott, we could, always, we could always just claim prescience and talk about it anyway. <laughs> we could we've got a spice beer here yeah. <laughs> there you go <laughs> there we go um, you know the the other part that I really uh, you know, okay the whole the whole um, uh, the ascension of Leto the Atreides mm-hmm. um, the death of his father fighting the Seleucid Bulls mm-hmm. um, again how Duncan plays into that whole thing but the how he works his way into the you know, Atreides' household, but uh, Leto is not his father. Uh, but there's a lot of his father and um, just the whole sending him to X to kind of learn what it means to be a worker and a common man and to associate and to, to not um, disconnect yourself from your roots were important lessons for him to learn before his father um, which I don't. What's his father's name again? Paulus. 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 So his father, Paulus Atreides, uh, you know, we, before he died, were invaluable lessons, invaluable mm-hmm. lessons, and um, and really inform and really inform him. And then uh, when he pulls that stunt on the uh, guild ship, probably one of the yeah. most brilliant moves that you can do. Like so, he's, he's being set up by the. He's being set up by the Harkonnen, and he doesn't know it, but he knows that something's happened, and he does the only thing he can think to do that will keep him from an all-out war. And I mean, I mean, this is kind of the concern that he has at the expense and risk of him losing his entire house. He's looking at being a man of integrity. He's our, in a sense, Leto is our moral compass in 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 House Atreides. I I always think of Leto as uh, uh, John Hurt. From from the miniseries. Oh yeah, like, he, like that was like the perfect casting. And oh yeah, I agree. That's him in my mind at all times. My and I think it was much better casting than the John Lynch film. But oh yeah, yeah. But, but I, yeah, just I, go ahead. I like I like John, the the Lynch casting though. Uh, oh, I yeah. like the look the look of him because he looked like the description in the book, the hawk nose and the yeah, uh, dark I, eyes I, and everything. I agree. He wore that uniform really well. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that, and I, and I guess I should say he looks probably much more like a duke than 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 Hurt does. Yeah, but it's just Hurt's uh, mannerisms. It's William, William Hurt. William Hurt. Right? Sorry, yeah. 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 William Hurt's mannerisms and the like, way he talks like was much more like the understanding. He was much more of a father figure to yeah. Paul yeah. than than that. But yeah. well, we'll talk about the movie. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> so, get yeah, we'll get that. Wait, sidetrack rabbit yeah. trail here. Yeah. But anyways. Go ahead. I know this. After reading these books so far, I would, uh, in a minute, when I retire, love to move to Caladan and live there. I, I, could, <laughs> I could really be happy there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. It sounds like it sounds like a really cool. I, I really like the way that they structure their like the government there with walking among the people and helping mm. helping them and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. You know, it, you see that in him. Uh, you're going to see that echoed again through a different character in House Harkonnen, mm-hmm. and um, and that seems to be it seems to be the mark. Are one of the things that 
you know, Kevin Janderson and Brian Herbert seem to be saying is that a mark of a good leader is one that doesn't disconnect himself from his people. Right. And that just seems to be uh, uh, some sort of commentary that seems to be running through there. Yeah. Well, I think we're kind of already starting to branch off into our next section, and that's talking about the characters. Yeah, that's why I thought I thought we yeah. were kind of doing that anyway. Yeah, so. we're, we're, we went from our favorite. It's hard not to talk about your favorite moments without talking about. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, so, are there any other favorite moments that we can bridge into characters? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's start off with the Benny Jesuit. Okay. Okay. So we're really introduced to them in this book. In this book. Right. I mean, we saw their the beginnings and the others, right. but we're really interested. The, uh, one of the things, one of the quotes was. You know, uh, you never forget the Benny Jesuit punishment. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was like... Okay, explain that explain, in, in this book. Yeah, in this book. So the, the, the way that, that they... Uh, what they're alluding to is the fact that uh, Reverend Mother Mohayam, uh uses the poisons in her body to take, make the Baron fat and weak and unable to walk because he has so much pride in his body. Right. Well, and it was really because of the rape. Yeah, he was, it, 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 it was. It was the rape. If he would not have raped her, I don't think it would have happened. No, but it was. It was. Uh, it was because he raped her and abused her that just is kind of, kind of was payback. Yeah. What is your impression of this Benny Jesuit community? I mean, these, these witches. One thing that I did notice while reading these books is that they don't thoroughly explain some of the some of the ideas. Like it's almost assumed. That you're familiar with a little bit of the universe, like they don't explain voice and and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, I, right. I kind of wish they would have talked a little bit more about that. But to me, it's just really amazing how, and, and I can I could see this happening. How they're so in tune with with their bodies and their minds that they can manipulate their chemistry. Um, yeah. You know. And, and I could actually see that happening if a person really focused on that. Mm -hmm. I, I, and, and, you know, they, they're called witches, but, uh, you know, I think they're, they're not that at all. They're just brilliant. Yeah, I don't, I don't sense, there isn't, <laughs> there isn't a sense, uh, there may be just a little bit, their way they, the way they can manipulate their voice and stuff like that, that it's a little bit witch-like, but it's not witch-like. When we think witches, we think of a, a lot of mysticism and magical powers. and yeah. um, It's not so much that, but they have literally, they've, through a lot of careful planning in the breeding, um, a lot of tuning themselves into the psychic world, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and, and putting themselves strategically in positions of power. Yeah. Um, really, really plays out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I, I like how the, that it's it, it was one of those things like they've have people everywhere, and you kind of get the notion of that with the Sayadinas in the in the Fremen. Mm -hmm. The Sayadinas are essentially reverend mothers within this community, and they don't even realize that the Bene Gesserit are there. So. I thought that was I thought that was really interesting, um, uh, and the fact that they don't really use psychic abilities anymore, and they were based off of a organization that was all psychic powers. They don't, but then they have this connection with all the other people that have gone before them. Right. So right. there is kind of a some sort of connection. The cell memory. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. But and a group that does have this sort of somewhat psychic, uh, not uh, powerful, but they have a psychic abilities, is the guild. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How did we like the introduction to the guild? Jim, what, what do you think of, of learning more about them? Uh, I love the Demur story and how they described almost step by step how he became a navigator, uh, how they tested the navigators, and Demur's brother, Soter, was not accepted. For training and things like that, it, it helped with a lot of understanding. And then the insight that we got to them being able to see the universe as a whole instead of just parts and so forth and so on. It, it was that was really neat. 
Yeah. yeah. It was it was it was certainly it was a interesting it was interesting especially as they develop that line in the next book. You see yeah. it much more developed. You get a little bit more insight into what that looks like. Um but just that whole fr the whole process. And it was interesting with them being twins and so joined how that how that you know devastated him for not making it. Uh -huh. and how quickly it was like you can't he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. You don't even get to say you bye. Yeah. 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 One of the things that I always I, I, I was always curious about is like why would anyone choose to become a navigator? And I like how this very like pretty much in the step by step how it changes changes you so much that you don't care that you're changed because right. it's such a mm -hmm. such a, yeah like Demur was so much like he almost just forgot almost instantly his his, his old life. And I and I thought it was it was interesting to see how they struggled. He struggled, and other navigators struggled to lower their themselves to be able to communicate with regular people. It was difficult for them to speak uh, Gaelic. Mm. Well, you know, when you're seeing the entire universe in it in in its entirety, relationships, familial relationships, and so forth and so on, would no longer be. They would be so small that it yeah. wouldn't matter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I hear you. You know, I think along with that, um, you know, if we're talking about, you know, um, being on um, being on X, you know, uh, we got to talk about the Vernies family. Yeah. Uh, because they're they're uh, they're somewhat central into this. In that, this is of course where Leto goes and where um, his friend, who is uh, who's who's Dominic. Romber um, goes, and then we have, of course, Dominic and Shondo Vernies that are all a part of this family. And when the Tlaxu take over because of what Emperor Elrude's kind of planned, you know, in a way to get back because he's married. The story in the background, of course, is that um, Shondo was a concubine of the Emperor at one point, mm -hmm. and this is his way of kind of getting back. And that whole takeover. And they're fleeing and kind of giving up their right to be part of any sort of lands rod mm -hmm. um, was absolutely uh, phenomenal, and uh, and uh, and to see how that all plays out in the end, mm -hmm. especially uh, when especially when you consider that they are attempting to make artificial spice. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Because the spice the spice operation on Arrakis is extremely expensive. It's not dependable. And they need a new source and a cheaper source. Uh, bring more money into House Carino. Mm -hmm. Well, if House Harkonnen wouldn't be hoarding all the spice, we wouldn't yeah. uh, we wouldn't have this problem, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to the House Vernius, they're skirting on whether or not they're breaking the jihad principles, right. which is kind of the excuse to bring it. Is right. What they bring in, yeah. The interesting thing is, is having just read those books, it's like. Everyone's breaking that. They have so much technology that would never have been the automated piloted systems that just drop you off at the planets. Like right. that would have never flown, and they're totally fine with. It. There's so many things that aren't on X that everyone else lives with that is just kind of like yeah. I, they would I would never be allowed. I I read it and my my red flags are going off. It's gonna it's alive. It's gonna get you. Yeah right. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's certainly interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, it's interesting how they kind of with Dominic Vernies after Shondo, of course, is killed. Uh, she's found out because they all split up as they go into this exile, I guess. Um, but Dominic Vernies kind of begins to rally the troops at the end, at the very end of the book, and then hides out on on Arrakis. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of don't see him for a while. He's kind of gone. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's just in his storyline, it feels kind of it's just kind of ends, but it it isn't because we see him crop up in the next book. Yeah. But um, I loved his character. I loved he he reminded me very much he reminded me very much of Paulus Atreides. Yes. In his sentiment and the way he carried himself. Yes, but more complacent. Yes. Now, however, on Ix, the workers were were they called them subaloids. Were yes. they, not, they weren't quite human, so yeah. uh, you know I gotta wonder if maybe the Vernius didn't have quite as much honor 
as uh, the Atreides did. Well, it's interesting because the Subvoids seem to have been a race that was kind of genetically created, is my understanding of that. They don't seem to be quite human. Like, the only reason they even rose up against House Vernes is because these face shifters, the Tulaxu uh, face shifters, came in and instigated it. Yeah. Um, and and even after the Tulaxu take over, they don't really, they kind of revert back to their old ways. They don't seem to have a lot of ambition. It's almost like, for better or worse, they were bred to be these subservient workers and... Yeah. And there's, even, there's even a scene where they destroy a building and then uh, no one's telling them what to do, and they're just like, oh, they go back to work. Right. So they don't know what the next step yeah. is. And I'm, I, I'm not saying, Jim, I'm not saying you're not right, because there's certainly there's a, there's, a, there's a place saying, well, they don't really, you would not see, for example, House Atreides doing this. No. Um, yeah, but in, 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 in another way, this reminds you very much of, um, oh, what was the planet that... Um, the Holtzman Shield, the Holtzman. Pur Pur Puritan, Puritan. That's not quite right. Is it? <laughs> Which was that? The one they nuked. No, they didn't nuke it. They used it. Poritrin. Poritrin, thank you. Poritrin. That was close. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, so Poritrin. You know, it reminds me very much of Poritrin a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Except that these people aren't technically slaves. Right. Right. But I don't know. But I hear, I hear what you're saying, Jim. Yeah. 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 Since we're kind of in that area, what did you think of the Tulaxu? Tulaxu. Uh, I still hate them. After yeah. ten thousand years, I still hate them. Still hate them. They're even worse now. They, <laughs> like everyone hates them. Yeah, they they are not very well liked anywhere. Uh, I guess everybody, well, people deal with them kind of because they have to, but they don't like it. Yeah, I can I, I can certainly understand why. Yeah, there's a lot of mystery around them, though. There is. About as much mystery as there is around the Bene Gesserits. Yeah, well, yeah. I feel yeah. like there's, for us as a reader, there's almost more mystery yeah. around the well, Tlaxu. That... You know, if they're, if they're still using human flesh for the same things they were using it before for, I could sure yeah. understand why they would want to keep security pretty tight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What uh, the other the other place, and this isn't a prominent storyline, but just to mention it is the, the the whole medical guild, the ones that were the one that they bring in Sook for doctors. Elrude. Yeah, what are they called? Sook doctors. Yeah, the Sook doctors, right? Uh, talk about it. There's a shroud of mystery, and well, nowhere have I read so far that they really explore that. I don't know if they do explore that ever really deeply. We just kind of it's briefly. The, it's the school started by Mohandas from the Butler. Or okay. The Battle of Corin. Okay. At the end, he goes off to start a school, and Anna real stays to start the sisterhood. Okay. So, oh, oh yeah, it, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. All well, right. I'll so I got one. One thing that comes through really big time with these with the Souk doctors is their how mercenary they are. Yeah. Oh yeah. But apparently, I mean, once you pay, that you've got them. Like they won't betray you. That's it's the, almost like going to the clinic right now. <laughs> you, walk in, you walk in. I need to see to see my doctor. The first question you get is, "How are you going to pay for this?" Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And if you can't pay, I'm sorry. You know. But I think that's a good thing about the Dune books, especially politically. There's so many levels that they that they, con they they comment on society, and you see that mm -hmm. you see politics, especially just playing out here, mm -hmm. all over the place. Uh, are there any other people we need to hit? We haven't hit the Fremen. We do got to hit the, the planetologist. Yeah. yeah, we haven't talked about the Fremen, uh, and we haven't talked about Her Carino and Harkonnen. Uh, those those two groups. Okay, so, so three groups actually. So, the Harkonnen we did talk briefly or round yeah. that way, but yeah, uh, but but they of course uh, we got to talk about the Null Shield. Let's talk about the Null Shield a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty big. Yes. Yeah, the Harkonnens have a device called a No Shield, and you can just it, anything within it is just like it doesn't exist. Right. Can't see it. Can't. Nothing can detect it. You can't see. Uh, you can't even see it through prescience. And know? the Harkonnens have the only one. And of course, they do the best thing they could ever do. They kill the inventor. <laughs> because yeah. because you know you only need one of these, right? I mean, how hard can it be to like reverse engineer the sucker? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're a Harkonnen, it's pretty hard, apparently. Right. This 
is one of the parts I remember we talked about before where I said things were spoiled for later books because of these new books. And the No Shield is... And do they come into the next books? They don't show up until the, like, the end of Frank Herbert's stuff, and it's like a new thing. From, okay. from not even from this people, like from main story people. Mm. And that's kind of like, okay, so you're telling me this technology existed thousands and thousands of years ago, just happened to be in the hands of the Harkonnen. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. But story-wise, I thought it was it's interesting in this story. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, they, and the way they used it to kind of set up, you know, um, and which ends up in the... Uh, <laughs> Excuse me. You have to edit that out. Oh, wow. Sorry about that. Sorry, Jim. If you're listening, <laughs> no sorry about that. Um, no but, uh, you know the way they use it to kind of set up Leo, you know, and then he he does uh, he, he what is what do they call it the term that he uses when he when he kind of calls for the certain type of forfeit, trial by forfeit, forfeiture right, mm-hmm. um, and the way he kind of sets that up, um, the the Harkonnens really thought they had him. Yeah. They were convinced. They didn't think that he would. They didn't think that he would call that that trial out. And if he did, I mean, he would have. Well, they win. thought they were going to start a war right then. Yeah. And then. I think everybody was pretty pretty surprised when Shaddam stepped in, and uh, and saved oh, yeah. the day. And do we know exactly why he did that? Was that just to kind of set him up as being the benevolent emperor? Well, well so go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. No, no, go. That's fine, David. Go ahead. I well, so Leto block, pulled a bluff, right? And said he knew about. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the, his, yeah. Yeah, he knew about something, but he didn't. He just was bluffing, right? And so, and and they had a way to rig it. Rig it. Fenrir had rigged it, but Shaddam was like, "I want no. We're not going to do it your way." Because all of a sudden, Shaddam wasn't going to be manipulated by Fenrir. He wasn't going to rely on him too much. Right. And this was his, Shaddam's way of solving the problem. Right. Rather than the, the way that Fenrir would have gone about doing it, bribing everybody. Right. So, right. But it was, he created a self... It's not... Leto doesn't have any ambitions to take over the Empire, but Shaddam realizes that he's created an enemy in Leto by all of a sudden giving him the popular vote. Right. Everyone everyone thinks of him as a hero now, so right. uh, he's like, if he wanted to, he could come after my throne. He's too popular. Right. So. Which, of course, he has no ambition. Really. Right. <laughs> right. But yeah. Um, that, so. I think that just about rose up. That rose is. Up, except for the Fremen. We didn't do the Fremen. And, and uh, Kynes. Kynes. That's the right. I, I think, look, Jim, handle this because we know how you're a big of a fan you are of the Fremen. Yeah, you love the Trump. Uh, yeah, uh, it was uh, with, uh, of course, in the original series, the uh, Leot Kynes, his father, Pardo Kynes, um, how single-minded he was, you know, to uh, look at the planet, look at the environment, analyze and see what was going on. This guy had to be had to be brilliant. He. Uh, talk the Fremen into getting everything set up, start making oasises, try to green up the planet a little bit. Uh, it didn't, it, it was working out pretty good. Uh, it, you know, and his son comes along. It's it's a great storyline. Yeah. Right. When it, and it is. Um, even his induction into the Fremen tribe is kind of an interesting story. You know, he kind of comes to the, he's been Trying to, he's been trying to kind of get into the Fremen tribe, and then he runs across these three youths that are being attacked by the Harkonnen tribes, uh, by the Harkonnen, not the tribe, but the Harkonnens. And he comes to the rescue, and they help him defeat him, and then they bring him back in, and then Stilgar, kind of head of the uh, head of the tribe. What do they call the head of the Fremen? The name. That was a he's a name. Um, and uh, and he doesn't trust him. He's either going to kill him, and then ends up he kind of he ends up being kind of viewed as a prophet. Um, to make a long story short, and then that that gives him the power he needs to begin to implement the changes because he really believes that at one time, way before, you know, even ten, even before ten thousand years ago, Arrakis was not a desert world. Right. And uh, we don't see that, but we just know it from this planetology. He said that at one time, Arrakis supported life, and so this vision, of course, is what drives him. 
And so they start at one of the poles they start at actually creating and trying to bring back this life. Right, right. Which there is one group that wasn't on our list that I just want to touch on, the worms. Yeah. They are a group that, that we learned a little bit more about the worms, just that when they die, they disintegrate into a bunch of little jelly-like creatures. Right. And so there's nothing left. Right. There's no... Uh, there's no and and apparently this process can be coded to other people because the Chris knife is coded to whoever owns it. And if the person dies, the Chris knife dissolves. Oh, so, so that's like that's so that's the significance of that. Yeah, that's the. It, I would have put that together. Yeah, well, there's I mean, there's other reasons why what happens with the words, but we'll learn later. But it's just kind of interesting that we learned you you can't kill one and dissect it. That's why they don't know oh, how yeah. they. They work because they just dissolve. Mm -hmm. And there's no remains because they dissolve. Right. So. Um, any other things we need to hit on? Are we pretty good as far as the uh, time-wise? I know we're getting close to our time limit here, but uh, anything else we should be talking about? I think we hit I, him I think we covered it. No, I do. I think so. I'm ready to move to the next section. Yeah, I guess favorite quotes. Yeah. Yes. Favorite quotes here. Um, well, uh, Jim, this is your section. Favorite quotes. Okay, hey, David, what do you got? Well, so a bunch of mine, you guys had already picked. Okay. Looking at our notes. So I had to go start, go looking for some other ones. So, hey, you snooze, you lose. Yeah, hey, <laughs> yeah you need to I snooze. I didn't snooze at all. <laughs> I still lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, like many culinary delicacies, Revenge is a dish best savored slowly after long and delicate preparation. Mm -hmm. Emperor Elrude IX said that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it keeps hitting home. The Carinos, man, they will wait to get back. You, oh, yeah. So maybe the Bene Gesserit, you never forget a punishment from a Bene Gesserit. But with the Carinos, you never know when it's coming. Right. And you won't expect it. Right. Right. Uh, and then <clears throat> how simple things... Uh, how simple things were when our Messiah was only a dream. Now, Stilgar says that as an adult, which he's not, he's just a child in this book, but right. that was a quote from him as an adult. And I, and that's kind of like, he's talking about uh, kinds, but I think he was, in this quote's actually referring to Moadib. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of interesting how they kind of parallel those two. Right. And then four things cannot be hidden. Love, smoke, a pillar of fire and a man riding and a man striding across the open bled, and that's a fr that's from in wisdom. Yeah. I thought that was kind of just a. I even put that one on Facebook it's, when it's I read it. It's a good. It. It's a good quote. Yeah, I like it. I like so. that quote. Yeah. And how about you, Scott? What did you find? Well, I think I have about three or four quotes. There are many good quotes <laughs> in this, but uh, um, so here's the first one. Among the responsibilities of command is the necessity to punish, but only when the victim demands it. And I thought that was an interesting twist, that like the victim's demanding it. And this is by Prince Raphael Carino. So, and he's, of course, the one initially that he's not gung-ho on just torturing people right away. Um, but this, of course, ultimately bites him in the butt because he ends up appearing weak in the subsequent future books. Um, the, other, the other one I like is I like blindness can take on many forms other than the inability to see. Fanatics are often blinded in their thoughts. Leaders are often blinded in their hearts. And this is a quote from the Orange Catholic Bible. I love that one. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Are, any fans out there aware of anyone who's compiled some sort of Orange Catholic Bible? I know. We need to, I mean, there, you think there have to be. Yeah. Or if anyone would, knows about that, please let us know. Yeah, or can point us maybe on the web where there's an Orange Catholic Bible. Yeah, uh, what is, I, I'm confused, what is the orange in reference to? That is. Know? I, no, I, I don't think we do, but I'm assuming it has to do with, the. I'm assuming it's formed from the cult of Serena, right? But why orange? Maybe the color, maybe that's a color they adopt or something. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to take a look at it. So if anyone knows why they call it the Orange Catholic Bible. Yeah, Bridge of yeah. Carthgear. Yeah, we're, any, we're waiting on you, man. You're our, yeah, yeah. our well of knowledge. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, another quote. Um, the uh, highest function of ecology is understanding the consequences. This is by Pardo Kynes. Um, so looking at ecology, understanding like how we interact with it and what the consequences of that are, I thought was pretty good. Yeah. Um, 
That's oh, this really, other one. Go that's ahead. really neat because uh, when I saw that, it. Reminded oh, you have that me. quote too. I didn't see you had that quote, Jim. I'm sorry. No, that, that's fine. I got plenty others. <laughs> okay. The the one thing that really struck me when I read that was uh, you remember Crocodile Hunter, Steve Irwin. Yeah. yeah. And how he talked about how the they brought in the toads to eat the beetles, and now nothing nothing can kill the toads. So the Australia is overrun by cane toads and things like oh, that. Oh yeah. Let's not forget about the Africanized bees. Right. Um, it, it's it is it is an ecosystem that needs to be watched carefully, in consideration for what's going to happen down the line. Yeah. 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 All right, I have one more quote, and this was a little <laughs> longer, but I thought it was really good. Um, the paintbrush of history has depicted Abelard Harkonnen as the, in a most unfavorable light. Judged by the standards of his older half-brother, Baron Vladimir, and his own children, Golasa Raven and Fedratha Raven, Abelard was a different sort of man entirely. We must, however, assess the frequent description of his weakness, incompetence, and foolhardy decisions in light of the ultimate failure of House Harkonnen. Though exiled to Lockvale and stripped of any real power, Abelard secured a victory unmatched by anyone else in his extended family. He learned how to be happy with his life. And that's by the Landsrod Encyclopedia of Great Houses, post-Jihad edition. And I did think that says... You don't see it in this book, but it sets us up for the next book when we see, when we truly see an Abler that is absolutely happy where he's at. Yeah. And totally unconcerned and trying to be different than his family. Well, and, he, uh, doesn't, he doesn't have any political aspirations. He just wants to have a life. Yes. A simple, a simple, happy life. Right. Right. Yeah. All right, Jim, uh, we're, uh, we're down to your quotes. Yeah. Um, what do I got here? Oh, something wants to restart my computer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. In Man. order to understand how to rule people, the old Duke had said, you must first understand the people themselves. Oh, yeah. Great quote. I, I really think that that's something we should probably send off to Congress and the president and whoever's <laughs> running for office. <laughs> I think that would really help. Yeah. Um, another one was... History allows us to see the obvious, but unfortunately not until it's too late. <laughs> that was one of the ones that was going to go under my list. I really like that one. That is a yeah. good one. Um, and then this one about House Atreides. Uh, House Atreides values loyalty and honor far above politics. He looked hard and insightful. Uh, look at his exhausted son. Leto drew a deep breath, perceiving the lessons like a sword thrust. Loyalty and honor, Paulus repeated. That is the way it must be. Um, and without a goal, and another quote was by Lady Helena, without a goal, life is nothing. Sometimes the goal becomes a man's entire life, an all-consuming passion. But once the goal is achieved, what then? Oh, poor man, what then? Right. Awesome. The, the last one is is back to that that comical thing that went on between uh, uh, the Baron and Raban and Piter. Uh, mm -hmm. This was later in the book uh, when the Baron was telling Raban how he was going to be running the no ship. Uh, he says, "If you fail, however, I'll see to it that you are transferred back to Lankyville, Lankyville." where you'll be trained any way your father wishes, complete with sing-alongs and the recitation of poems about brotherly love. <laughs> and you can just picture him saying that to his, uh, to, to his nephew. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So those are my quotes. Yeah, go, go, go sing Kumbaya. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, like, that's, the, that's the equivalent. You know, the little... Uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Why well, I mean, that brings us about to our closing thoughts. Yeah, okay. So let's let's go over a couple things. Now, first, how would you rate this book? Jim, what's your rating for the book? Four four point five. Four point five. All right. Yeah. 
Scott? 4.5. I agree with you. 4.5. I'm with that. I'm going to go with a 3.8. Oh, way to be different, David. I know. Yeah. But I look, know. Let me tell you, you know, when you look at this book, initially when you're reading this right after the uh, ori- the, the first, the opening trilogy of the in time-wise of the saga, the Butler and Jihad, yeah, it's kind of a slap upside the face because you're used to there being a lot of action, and so suddenly it slowed down and it's political. It took me a little bit to get into it, but I found myself being so engaged with the politics of, of it, wanting to see how it played out. There were very few times that I found myself just waiting for the next section to pass, and for me, that's a good sign. And and I have to give this book into the, it has to be in the fours for me. Well, okay, what took it down just a notch for me? And maybe it's because I did 12 hours of reading. Yeah, and it ended at 6 o'clock <laughs> this morning. <laughs> it just felt like, it was like Return of the King. It felt like it never, it just like, every time I thought it was ready to end, there was another chapter, and I was like, I thought we were done with these guys. Like, what more is there to say? Come on, like, how much more closure do I need for this character? And 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 truth, truth be told, those last couple tra- chapters were the only ones that had kind of the repeat information issue that we had in the other books, where it just was like, in order to get to what they wanted to do to close them up, they just kind of repeated just a little bit. And I was well, like, and I think they're kind of in this last chapter setting us up for the next book. Yes, that's the thing. They, you know, yeah. they wanted you to come back, reasons for you to come back. Right. But I was like, I just want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. So, yeah, that's my rating. I, I mean, that's kind of where I would rate it, and I understand why you'd rate it there. Yeah. No, especially, you got, you, especially after 6 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are already well in to House Harkonnen. I can't answer but, this next so question. So the normal next question is, what are you looking forward to? So, uh, so, so David, what are you looking What am I now? looking forward to? Of course, <laughs> you know, I have read the books before, but I don't remember what happens in each one. Uh, I am looking forward to seeing more of uh, the relationships of House Harkonnen, of course. I really find that kind of interesting. And they're so evil, but at the same time, it's like it's just a weird dynamic that's happening there. Um, one of the things that's always driven home, and they, they talk about this with, with Leto, is that um, you can't marry for love. Yes. And he kind of has a love interest. He does. And now we all, we all know, for those who are familiar with Dune, he has a different love interest in the future. Right. And so I'm kind of wondering... I am interested to see how that happens. Because yeah. that has not... Where I'm at in the book, it has not happened yet. Yeah. I'm just kind of like, what's yeah. going to go on here? So. so for me, one of the things that I'm looking forward to is finding out, how does Dominic Vernes get back? Yeah. Get back at Emperor. Yeah. And because because he's going to. And uh, where I'm at in the book, he has cropped up, but we don't see exactly what he's planning yet. Mm-hmm. So, how about you, Jim? Is there anything uh, for you, I'm Jim? Not, I am not going to comment on that, Scott, because I'm not going to spoil it for you. <laughs> okay. Um, however, at the point I'm at in the book, was a very, very sad and tragic event. Um, and the person who is responsible for this happening, I want to see that person burn. I really do. <laughs> Between now and the next ten percent of the book that I have to read, I want to see this person burn. <laughs> oh man! Now you have my curiosity. <laughs> oh, uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Just a reminder for all of you who are listening: if this is your first time and you're not familiar with what we're doing here, we thrive on your feedback. Absolutely. So, uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us and be a part of our listener feedback show, which airs roughly two weeks after this show does, where we'll be talking about your comments of House of Trades, please, please, please email us at dunesagapodcast at gmail dot com or leave a comment on our Facebook page, which is facebook dot com slash Dune Saga Podcast. Right. And you can also contact us via Twitter at Dune Saga Podcast is our handle. Right. And so. you can uh, call us at our voicemail, 1-888-508-4343. You'll probably hear, um, it's also the voicemail we use for the Sci-Fi Diner Podcast, but we kind of designate that. And you can say which one you want to leave a message to, and you want to leave it for the Dune Saga Podcast here. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously visit us at the com, where you can find links to everything that we just said in the show as well as the calendar that shows approximately when we'll be recording next and which we don't know but we'll let you know up there if you want to check that out and um, 
and we'll uh, it'll probably be near the end of March, as I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully, David will get a little bit more sleep then. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> doing all right. I'm doing all right. Yeah, you're doing get more coffee, more coffee. Um, well, I believe that's about it. Yeah. So once again, for the Dune Saga podcast, I'm David Moulton. I'm Scott Herzog. Jim Arrowwood here. And may Shai Hulud clear the path before you. And stop. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And then you want to start another project. Start here. another project here. Woo. Yeah. I thought I thought I'd let somebody else do the Shai Hulud thing tonight. <laughs>